Well, let me just begin by saying uh, I'm Kate Seeley, a senior vice president of the Middle East Institute. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome you to the second half of our program, our awards ceremony. A little bit of history, MEI presented its first award, the Visionary Award, just six years ago to bring greater attention and visibility in Washington, D.C. to individuals from the Middle East engaged in outstanding work in the region. Now, those of us immersed in the Arab world and the Middle East, as so many of us are at MEI, have had the privilege to meet the region's visionaries, the entrepreneurs and activists, the philanthropists and change makers, the artists and architects who have become role models in their fields, not just locally, but also internationally. And yet their efforts, the amazing human capital that exists in the Arab world, in the Middle East, remains largely unknown to American audiences, overshadowed, of course, by the headlines which have been especially bleak of late. So all the more reason for our awards, an opportunity to recognize and support those individuals who've shown the talent, the passion, and the commitment to make a profound difference in their communities. Our first award recipient six years ago was Palestinian doctor Izzedine Abu Aish, who lost his entire family in Gaza in 2009 and turned that tragedy into an opportunity to call for peace and reconciliation. Former Deputy Prime Minister Issam Ferris was another one of MEI's early award recipients for his foundation work to bring better health services and uh, schooling and uh, health care to the needy in North Lebanon. He then endowed a second uh, award uh, for which MEI is deeply appreciative, the Assam M. Ferris Award for Excellence, giving us two awards with which to recognize extraordinary individuals. And tonight's award recipients are indeed exceptional and extraordinary men who've risen to the top of their respective fields, but who have not been content with personal success alone, but have been driven to give back to their communities through their foundations and their charitable work. I will not say more since I am not introducing these individuals, but instead I'm introducing the uh, presenters of the awards who are each extremely uh, successful and, and accomplished in their own right. Ambassador Richard Murphy will be introducing the Assam M. Ferris Award winner, Mr. Ayman Asfari. And we asked Dick, who is on our board, to do so because he shares so much in common with Mr. Asfari. Uh, to begin with, both men share a deep, deep love uh, for Syria and its well-being. Uh, Dick was the first U.S. ambassador to Syria after the freezing of U.S.-Syrian relations following the 67 war, and he was assigned there in 1974 and went on to have a very illustrious career in the State Department. In 1983, he was made Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs, where he was very active in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process and was recognized with many awards. Since retiring in 1989, Dick has served as a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and has served on numerous boards, including the board of the American University of Beirut, which is very dear to my heart, a distinction he shares with Mr. Asfari. Uh, the other distinctions he holds is that of being a longtime and very dear family friend. I have known Dick since I was about three. Even then, he struck me as very tall. Uh, I think I have grown uh, about as tall as he has, but he still towers in my esteem for everything he has done as a diplomat and as somebody to increase American understanding of the region. Uh, our other award presenter tonight is uh, Secretary Ray Lahoud, who will be introducing Mr. Shafiq Gabur. Uh, who is receiving the Visionary Award. Now, I have not known Mr. Lahoud since I was three, but I have followed his career since he won a congressional seat in 1994 in Illinois, making him one of the few Arab Americans uh, in Congress and hence someone to keep an eye on. His father is Lebanese, I should note his mother German. He had a very distinguished tenure in Congress, a 14-year run characterized by, among other things, uh, his effort to encourage bipartisanship a rare commodity these days. In 2008, President Obama asked uh, the Republican from Illinois to join his administration as Secretary of Transportation, where Ray went on to spearhead many efforts to stimulate the economy through transportation projects. But perhaps he's most famous for his efforts to shine a light on distracted driving, i.e. texting and driving, which of course nobody does in this room. Uh, when he took office, uh, just 18 states, 
had passed laws to fight distracted driving when he left in 2013. That number had more than doubled to 41. He is also, according to everyone uh, who knows him, a fabulous guy. I mean, he's half Lebanese, so how could he not be? As, <laughs> well, shout out for the Lebanese. Uh, as someone wrote recently, Ray survived 32 years inside that dangerous, mudslinging beltway with not one blemish on his character or reputation. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce both men tonight. We're very privileged and honored to have them here presenting the awards. And now I'd like to invite Ambassador Dick Murphy to the stage to present the uh, Issam M. Ferris Award for Excellence. Well, thank you very much, Kate, and ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to be with you and an honor to have been asked uh, to present the award to Ayman Asfari tonight. What we have in common is Aleppo, where I went with my family first in 1960. I think he was somewhat short of his mature personality in 1960, uh, having about two years old, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the, we served in the Consulate General then, and they were very happy years in a very happy city. But Ayman, he was born the son of a Syrian diplomat, which meant that he passed his, much of his childhood outside of his country in, in Turkey, in the Czech Republic. And like uh, so many children of diplomats who have grown up in homes where government to government relations were a prime focus, he chose not to follow in his father's footsteps. I assume to his father's regret, it's something I've experienced in my own family. Nonetheless, he has pursued a career which has taken him far outside what many would consider a normal comfort zone and developed capacities that diplomats can only dream of achieving. After higher education at Villanova, taking a master's of science in civil and urban engineering at the University of Pennsylvania, he worked in Oman in the civil mechanical construction energy industry before joining Petrofac, which was a provider of oil field services to the international oil and gas industry. That was in 1991. Ten years later, he had moved to the point of buying out Petrofac. He took it public in 2005. And uh, it's today a British multinational, of which he is chief executive, and has some 18,000 employees with considerable annual revenues. In 2002, he created the foundation which bears his name. It supports projects in the United Kingdom, in Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, it aims at, among other things, empowering youth through educational opportunities and grants to promote the development of a strong civil society in the Arab countries. The foundation also provides relief to the Syrian people, improving education for refugees, supports Syria's emerging civil society, and works to increase aid for Syrians in need an enormous task, as we all recognize. He has also been active through his foundation, establishing a center for Syrian studies at St. Andrews University in the UK, and providing funding for Syrian Deeply. Syrian Deeply is an independent website launched to provide clarity, understanding of the current crisis in that country. 
and I strongly recommend it uh, to any of you who are not familiar with it as a site for all who seek a richer understanding of the complex Syrian situation, Syrian deeply. Today, Ayman Asfari is a member of the senior panel of advisors of Chatham House in London. He's on the board of trustees of the American University of Beirut, where our own paths have crossed. His foundation has endowed the AUB's Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship, working to advance research and other initiatives to encourage the development of an informed and an active citizenry as well as transparency and accountability in the governments of the Middle East. Well, I hope that this brief introduction serves to explain to this audience why the Middle East Institute has chosen Ahmed Asfari to receive this year's Isam M. Faris Award for Excellence. I'm honored to present it, and Mr. Asfari, please. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Murphy. Uh, thank you all. I, I don't know what to say because uh, Richard said it, uh, said it all. Uh, I'm truly honored and humbled uh, to be recognized uh, tonight amongst uh, this esteemed audience. Uh, I was educated in this great country. And uh, after working in the Gulf for 11 years, I moved on to Petrofac, and I started Petrofac International. And to me, the big consideration when I moved is I, want, I, I actually moved to London for one simple reason. I didn't move for the weather or for the cost structure. I moved because I wanted to be involved in setting a business where the foundations of the business are solid, they are rooted in a place which recognizes the importance of the rule of law. And this is something that we sorely miss in the region. And really after more than 25 years in the UK, I realized that there are so many other talented people in the region that could do the same thing. They could build institutions, they could create employment opportunities, they could create prosperity and they could build businesses if they are not beholden to a government official, to corrupt practices, and if there was a framework and a rule of law that promoted the same issue. And I see this in my business today. I see that we have tremendous talent in the region. We, in Petrofac, we hire 400 fresh graduates here. We, had, we hire 200 from the region. We hire people from Syria, from Lebanon, from Algeria, from Tunisia. And I see the talent, they're all dying and they're all uh, you know, absolutely craving for the opportunity. And you bring them in and they're shy and they're, they're, they don't know how to uh, uh, address you and so on. And a year or two years later, they challenge you on the, what you're doing right, on, on the strategy of the business. So this, this talent is there. It's just extremely unfortunate that uh, that there is no framework and there, is, there, there isn't a chance for this talent to flourish and to achieve its potential. The, we have a region that suffers from lack of good governance. It suffers from lack of accountability, good education. We have gender inequality. And we've had very unfair and unequitable distribution of wealth. 
There is no doubt in my mind that these were the roots for the Arab uprising. And unless, unless all these issues are addressed, we will continue to have long-term issues. And we will not achieve, and I'm, I'm using the phrase of Thomas Friedman, the sustained order in the region that we all want to have. Um, my, my lovely wife, Sausan, who's with me here tonight, and I started the Asfari Foundation in 2006. And uh, she should be with me here to be recognized because we started this together. <laughs> we, we wanted to play a very small role in helping these transitions, helping empower young people to work towards change. This is why uh, we, we only work with young people. We support education in various forms, and this is why we help civil society practitioners and organizations in our target countries. At the foundation, we envisage an Arab region in which young people play an active role as citizens who help develop their societies through education, engagement, and free thinking. To encourage this, we support master's scholarships at reputable UK or universities for Arab students, and we train for this advantage but bright young people to find work. We also envisage the Arab world having active, resilient civil society organizations. And I'm realistic, this is not gonna happen in two or three years. I'm realistic, this is a generational issue. But we want a, we want a society that stands up to the rights of the vulnerable and ensure accountable governors. We want to encourage this through support of research, education, and networking between civil society and academia, that's why we started the, uh, the institute at the American University of Beirut, the establishment of free media in Syria through the Syrian organizations, and we provide fellowships at the Chatham House in London for young civil society leaders from the Arab region. And while Syria burns, the foundation will continue to work with reputable partners to provide relief aid, such as medical care, shelter, and food to Syrians in need. But we also support the education of Syrian refugee children and young people to enable them to build a future and we support new secular Syrian civil society organizations with a grant and capacity building. We support them because peace comes, and I'm absolutely confident it will eventually. The young people and organizations we've helped can turn it, build a peaceful, tolerant, and productive Syria for the future. And I just want to say a couple of words here about, about Syria. This is not in my speech. But I spend the day to day talking to people in, in the various uh, government organizations about the solution. I, I genuinely believe that the, there's only one solution to the Syrian conflict, and that is creating a transition government in Syria that is inclusive, that is representative of all the parties in Syria, including the Alawites, the moderate Sunnis, that is based on the institutions of the state, so we do not want to destroy the institutions of the state, but could not include anyone who does not have the same vision, which means it cannot include Assad, and it cannot, and, 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 and it cannot include the Islamists who have a vision in Syria for an Islamic state. This vision of Syria is the vision that 90%, 95% of the Syrians want. And the problem I have with the current US policy, with an ISIL first approach, is this is a policy that unless it is put in the context of a narrative, to get to the ultimate solution of a political solution in the country, it is going to be seen as something that is supporting the current Assad regime. It is going to attract more moderates to become radicals. It's going to fuel radicalism in the country. So I urge Senator Cain and everyone in this country, as you debate the Syrian conflict, you are only going to achieve peace in the country by having a political transition in the country. And there is only one solution, a power-sharing structure that guarantees the participation of all the Syrians. And there are many measures, many steps that have been taken to ensure that we get there. So I hope that this is something that is considered. I will do my small part in parting with this point and I know that at the end of the day, even if I'm not listened to, I will not stop trying. I would, I would like to thank 
Ambassador Chamberlain, uh, Chairman Clark, the Sam Ferris family, and the Middle East Institute for really honoring me with this award. I feel this award, and genuinely should not go to me, I would like to dedicate this to all the brave young men and women who stood up to be counted all across the Arab world. The young citizens who can see a different future in which all Arab citizens can thrive through the work that we do in the Aspire Foundation, we will do a very small part to continue to support them in reaching that goal. Thank you very much. Good evening. In case you forgot about my introduction, I'm Ray LaHood. Uh, I won't repeat the introduction. I was asked uh, by MEI and my friend Shafiq to present the Visionary Award, and I am grateful and honored to have that opportunity. Before I do that, I want to say one word about MEI and what an extraordinary organization it is to gather so many people together for this dinner and to gather so many people together for the next few days to talk about the region, talk about the issues, talk about the solutions. Uh, This is an extraordinary organization. And to all of you that are here tonight supporting MEI, thank you for doing that. And to those who serve on the board, uh, those who are the staff that uh, run the day-to-day operation, thank you. We're in your debt for what you do day in and day out to promote peace and to promote the kind of opportunities for people who live in the Middle East. Let's give it up for the MEI and all that they do. And I want to say a word about one other individual who's here, who devoted his life to public service, unfortunately will not be back in Congress, but was a dear, dear friend, particularly to Lebanon, but also to the Middle East region, devoting whatever time and energy away from his congressional district to Lebanon and to the Middle East, Unfortunately, uh, he won't be back in the Congress next year, but he has served his time, served us well, an extraordinary public service, Nick Rahal from West Virginia. (laughs) Nick, stand up. Stand up, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for all that you've done. I'm sorry uh, that we're for the other members of Congress that we didn't introduce, but this man needs to be recognized. Tonight, the Visionary Award recipient is someone that all of us in this room know. And when you think of Visionary, what do you think about? You think about someone who looks beyond the horizon. You think of someone who is not blinded by conflict. You think of someone that is not blinded by turmoil. You think of someone who continues day in and day out to have the vision to move forward, to make progress, to take care of people. And that is what Shafiq's life has been all about his entire life. This is an individual that has been very successful in business and been very successful in building businesses, been very successful financially, but he has never forgotten where he came from. And frankly, he's never forgotten the people who helped make him successful. The best example I can give when there was so much turmoil in Egypt, when there was a change in government, 
when Mubarak fell, when the Muslim Brotherhood came into power, when many of Shafiq's businesses were teetering, when employees couldn't go to work, Shafiq never gave up on his employees. He continued to pay them throughout all of the turmoil, throughout all of the time when the businesses were not doing as well as they once did. He took care of his people. That's the kind of businessman he is. That's the kind of CEO he is. He did not lay his people off. He did not tell them they should go without pay. He took care of them and their families. And in doing so, he took care of his brothers and sisters. He never forgot where he came from, and he never forgot the people that brought him there. Shafiq is a friend to all. He is a bridge builder. He's been very helpful in building bridges between Egypt and America, very helpful in building bridges between new leadership in Egypt and America, been very helpful in building bridges all of his life, connecting people, all in a positive way, not for himself, but for the country that he loves, the people that he loves, he is as good American as any American I've ever met. He loves Egypt. He loves the Egyptian people, but he also loves America. And he sees the connectivity and the importance between a strong, good relationship between Egypt and America. He is a bridge builder. He is a connector. He, has, he is someone who has been very, very helpful over this long period of turmoil. Why? Because he's a visionary. Because he can look beyond the turmoil. Look beyond the conflict. Look beyond the horizon. And always see hope and opportunity. And he's done it very well. The one, pro Shafiq has been involved in many programs. He helped start uh, AmCham in Egypt because he saw the value again of connecting people, building bridges between people. The one program that I think, I don't know if his, his proudest, but it's one that I think he is very proud of. It's a program called the East-West, East The Art of Dialogue, Promoting Exchanges Between the U.S. and Egypt, and I have watched it. I've watched the young people that he has mentored, that he has nurtured, that he has helped educate, and the connection and the bridges that have been built between America and, the, and, and, and Egypt. It's an extraordinary program. It's about the next generation. It's about fostering the next generation. It's about the opportunities to connect the next generation so that we don't have the same turmoils and that we can create the kind of visionaries that Shafiq is. So that program, among many, will be one of his lasting legacies. I don't know of another visionary that deserves this award more than Shafiq. He couldn't have done it without two beautiful women in his life, Gigi, his wife, and Malik, his beautiful daughter, who's a student at Yale University. They have been a big, big part of all that he has done. And I know many of you have seen his magnificent art collection, and that is a vision that helps us understand different cultures. And his collection, again, has been a real opportunity for bridge building and connectivity. So it is my honor to present the Middle East Institute Visionary Award to Shafiq Gaber. No one deserves it more than you do, Shafiq. Congratulations.
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, I, I have no words to thank you, Ray, for this introduction. I, I hope my un, my <laughs> I hope my remarks will reflect just one percent of the kind words that you have said. Distinguished guests, members of Congress, ambassadors, Wendy, friends and family. Allow me first to extend a very warm congratulations to my fellow ORD, Ayman Asfari. Ayman is an incredible man. He's not only an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, he's a humanist. And I agree totally, he should have shared that award with Sousan because she is the force behind him. <laughs> I also want to thank all my friends and family that are here, many of whom have traveled many, many miles from Egypt, from Paris, from Dublin, from New York, from Los Angeles, from Kentucky. Uh, thank you for being here for me. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Middle East Institute for all the excellent work that they have been doing. Truly, at this specific time in history, they have been doing a lot of multidimensional work on strengthening Middle East-U.S. relations. I also truly want to congratulate Ambassador Chamberlain on all the MEI initiatives, and one that is very close to my heart that is coming up, the initiative of developing an art and culture anchor to the U.S.-Arab relationship. Today, I am receiving the Visionary Award, and for that, I'm very grateful. But I also always remind myself that being a visionary can also both be a blessing and a curse. As Secretary LaHood said, being a visionary is being able to see beyond the horizon. Many, many years ago in the 70s, Alex and I watched a movie. It was a hero who prayed that he could wake up in the morning and be blessed by reading tomorrow's newspaper. And one day, he opened today's newspaper, but he was reading tomorrow's news. His success in frame and success financially became overwhelming. Imagine for a moment if you can open the newspaper and read tomorrow's news. But until one day, he opened the newspaper to read his obituary. It said that he was found killed in a hotel near his home. That hero struggled very hard to remain as far from that hotel as possible. At the end, he did not go to the hotel, and he was shocked still next day to find his obituary on the front page. But to his relief, he found that he had lost his wallet. And the person who was killed in that hotel was not him. He would pray that he would lose that gift completely. The second story that I always remember when we talk about visionaries is the story of Muhammad and Cohen, who lived in the same street. Each morning, they would wake up and pray to the Lord to win the lottery. And they prayed very, very hard. This went on for a very long time until one day the clouds parted and a very strong booming voice came from above. And it said, Cohen, Muhammad, I'll make you win the lottery, but first you have to buy a ticket. <laughs> I come away from these two stories with two things. First, be careful what you ask for. And second, wishful thinking is not enough in this world of complex challenges. And many of these challenges have been talked about by Senator Kane and by Ayman earlier. Let me share with you, if I may, for a few moments, some bad news and some good news, and just close with a few remarks, some unconventional thoughts. Maybe Professor Trachtenberg will forgive me if I become too unconventional. The bad news is, as we sit here tonight, not only the Middle East, but the whole world is faced by a phenomena that we do not seem to be absorbing well enough. 
That phenomena is the rise of non-state terrorist actors across the world. They are creating mayhem, and they are truly undermining the core of our humanity. The cornerstone of the world order we live in today is the nation state. And that is under attack, not just in the Middle East, but from Ukraine to Somalia and from Pakistan to Nigeria. Even countries like Russia and China and Myanmar and Mali are witnessing this phenomena of non-state actors that is undermining our present world order. The world we live in today is witnessing increased propensity of challenges. Not only increased challenges, but even more complex challenges that sometimes we watch across the world and see leaders struggling to come up with a strategy. And as Ayman said, these challenges are very diverse, from health challenges to poverty, to conflict, to youth unemployment, to debt, racism, environmental degradation, war and terrorism, just to mention a few. But the danger is we're a very connected community today across the world. And these conflicts are permutating. And they're permutating very fast. And unless we recognize that, we will be all in trouble. And the trouble will not remain in one region. We talk about Ebola. Who knows what we're going to talk about tomorrow? if we do not recognize the importance of working together on health issues. Today, we are confronted by a network of complex challenges. And the other side of the problem, what I worry about, is we're becoming immune in our different communities to these problems. Look at the refugees around the world. Look at the bombing, the killing, and the beheadings. God forbid that this becomes the new normal. Because we are now living and witnessing these things, and it seems we just continue in our own activity. We have, unfortunately, previously had a major wake-up call in 9-11. We had other wake-up calls. I hope we will have the vision today to work east and west before another wake-up call takes place. I don't need to tell you this. You know what's happened in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, Libya, Kashmir, Yemen, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which remains after so many years. Let me just close this point about bad news with three things. As Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women not to do anything. And frankly, in the face of rising terrorism globally, we cannot afford appeasement. We need to confront this cancer across the world. <laughs> Whatever the name they operate under, be it ISIL or other, we need to confront it. And yes, the U.S. has a leadership role, but the world also needs to participate very seriously. The U.S. cannot do this alone. There is, as Churchill said, in my opinion, a gathering storm that is happening around the world. We may not be recognizing it, just as we didn't recognize the financial crisis in 2007, but it is that gathering storm is happening right now and is trying to undermine the nation states concept. And unless nation states around the world, east and west, work together, we will all pay a price. Secondly, this is a time for visionary political leadership. Leadership that can cross the aisle, leadership that can cross over negativity and promote constructive dialogue. Leaders that I remember, like Sadat, like Rabin, leaders like George H.W. Bush, who could create a real coalition of boots on the ground. I just want to remind everyone, liberating Kuwait, there was 33,000 Egyptian troops on the ground. There was 20,000 Syrian troops on the ground. President George Bush could pick up the phone and talk to leaders. We need leaders around the world that can do the same thing, especially now. 
more than ever before. Third point is I am concerned that the East and West are talking at each other rather than to each other. And we really truly need to bring that gulf and deal with it. And I think an institution like the Middle East Institute is a fantastic platform to play a role in doing that. And I truly encourage you all to support in many different ways. There are so much great minds in this room, in so many diverse areas, not only in politics, not only in business, in media, and in many different things. And I think this is the time to step up and work with the Middle East Institute. Let me turn to some of the good news. The good news is there's so many good initiatives on the ground that are doing good. I believe there are two paramount issues. An issue in my part of the world where people like Ayman and others can have institutions that can make a difference. Our generation in our part of the world have not succeeded and we're investing in the next generation to make a difference. On the other hand, there are many initiatives, and I will recount some of them, that are building bridges between East and West. The Asfari Foundation, the Safwan Foundation, the Orman Foundation, the Sawiris family, the Hariri family, the Ali Riza family, the Jofeli family, and my own are rising to the challenge. And we hope to find counterparts in the West that not only look at the West, but also build bridges with the East. That is very important. All right, just a few personal words, and, and I will close with some unconventional ideas. By way of background, I'm Egyptian born and bred. My business headquarters are in Egypt. I'm proud to have two foundations, one in Egypt and one in the United States. As some of you may know, when I turned 16, my late father called me to his study and said, this is your last allowance. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. I started working back then. Both my parents passed away very young. 53 and 48. My grandfather survived both of them and we were very close and he always used to insist and say it again and again. If you can do something for the society and community you live in, you have to do it. It's an obligation, it's not an option. I owe my values, my success and my deep commitment to what I do to my parents and to my country, Egypt. I wish my parents would be with me today but I'm sure they're up there smiling I also owe my perseverance, persistence, and being able to weather many storms to my wife, who's sitting here, Gigi, and... Uh, <laughs> and I'm very proud to say that as I come closer to retirement, I'm now spending over 60% of my time on the foundations. In Egypt, we're working heavily on education, and I believe it's education, education, education that can change society. It can bring democracy, and it can integrate diversity, and it can bring a market economy. Without education, it doesn't work. I'm very proud our foundation covers schools in the most underprivileged areas in Egypt. We have over 23,000 primary schools. And our work covers many different aspects, but it also brings to these schools a whole new concept. It brings a theater, it brings a music program, a cultural program, a sports program, and we work with these kids with the hope that they're gonna be Egypt's leaders in the future. We also work with higher education, and I am very proud and happy that I see Lisa Anderson here, the president of the American University of Cairo. The American University of Cairo is a beacon for education, and not only do I really recognize what they have done, I just want to share a very short sort of story. I couldn't afford to go to the AUC and I had to negotiate with my late father. I had to tell him I wanted to go to the AUC and uh, he looked at me and said, all right, do you have the money to do it? I said, no. He said, all right, I'll give you the money to go for the first year. If you get a scholarship, I'll wipe the debt. If you don't get a scholarship, you pay me over two years and you cross the Nile to Cairo University, which was for free. Thank God I got a scholarship. And not only that, the AUC paid me 30 pounds a month. That's five and a half dollars back then. <laughs> AUC is a beacon for education. Every American and Egyptian should be proud of what the AUC is doing. And I am extremely proud to see 
a table of people that are so much involved in the world of education, with Paul, Stephen, Vali, Lisa, I hope we can strengthen American-Egyptian work in that area. Our American Foundation, as Secretary LaHood said, does many things. But one thing I'm very, very proud of, and I'm very proud that two of the American fellows are here, Stephanie Kate and Michael Goff, who came all the way from Oregon. I'm very happy that you are here. This is what is called the East-West, the Art of Dialogue. What is this about? It's an initiative that brings young Americans, aged 24 to 35, and Egyptians together. Together on a very intensive program. They always complain that the program starts at seven. Americans taught me about the working breakfast, which I do not like, but I follow. It's half men, half women. And they go through a very intense program of knowing what Egypt's all about. Then they come to the United States and go to New York, New Jersey, New Haven, Atlanta, Virginia, DC. And they truly go into an intensive program. Not only that, after the program is concluded, they do collaborative projects together in many different domains. And the foundation funds 50% of that, hoping to maintain bridges of understanding between Egypt and the United States. But I'm also proud to say that the class of 2015 is gonna add young people from Bahrain, from Great Britain, and from Ireland. And we're hopeful this will continue down that path. If anything, we all need to invest in the next generation. The world we live in today is connected 24-7. Email, Skype, Twitter, social media, all these different things that we all sort of use every day. But I'm very worried that that type of communication, where the soundbite and the photo op reign, can create misunderstandings, can create misperceptions, and also can create the fear of the other. Our world today, sadly, is of the abbreviated text, where a meeting is a Skype, and a conversation is limited to a number of characters. Today we touch our screens much more than we touch our friends and much more than we touch our loved ones. And in reality, I feel we have lost touch. This makes us look at everything in our own narrative, and that worries me. We always have to look on the other side of that coin to understand. Let me make four unconventional suggestions in my closing remarks. I strongly believe leaders of different faiths need to, need to credibly and strongly delegitimize the use of false interpretation of religion for political purposes. And the Muslim world has to step up in that area in a very strong way. Secondly, political leaders need to create a global coalition. And I agree with Senator Kane. It is not just hard power that is going to work. We're going to need soft power to be able to drain the swamp of global terrorism and cross-border criminal activity. Third, let me say this to you, and I personally got trouble in my own country in 2007 trying to push change and democracy. Forcing the implementation of democracy in transitional regimes does not work. Democracy is not instant coffee. Democracy is not just the ballot box. Democracy needs the institutions. Democracy needs education. That is what makes it sustainable. And investing in that is what can make a change. Finally, <laughs> let me say something that, again, is unconventional. Do not arm rebels to fight our fights. What we could be doing is creating another Al-Qaeda. ISIS today is just the flavor of the month. Tomorrow it's going to be physis and mysis and lysis. What we truly need to do is work together to contain and globally eradicate this. And it will only happen if we have greater cooperation based on common ground, common values, and shared interest. Let me again thank the Middle East Institute for the recognition and excellent work, and may we work together to avoid a gathering storm and embrace a new dawn of human understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know. You need to give your hand. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, now, now stay, stay in your seats, stay in your chairs, because uh, I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going, I promised you a surprise in the, uh, the beginning of our, our evening today. And uh, I, I, b before I tell you our surprise, I want to say how moved I was by our speakers this evening. Uh, first, Senator McCain, but also to thank very deeply Ayman uh, uh, Asri and Shafiq Gabri. And our, and our presenters, Richard Murphy and uh, Secretary Ray LaHood. But the surprise, and for all of you who are friends of the Middle East Institute and who have sat in our very small and cramped and uncomfortable conference room for so many years, for actually 68 years, the good news is that in 2015, we're going to knock those walls down, we're going to renovate the Middle East Institute, we're going to expand our conference room, and by this time next year, we'll be able to accommodate 130 people in our conference room. Now, I promised you a surprise, but I actually have two. Because the, the second initiative at the Middle East Institute in 2014, which will carry on into 2015 and, and in the future, is that we have created a, an international advisory council Three of our members are here today. Shafiq Gabre is one of them. Uh, uh, Eddie Zweider uh, is another. And uh, uh, we are very pleased to say that there are both Americans and people from the region on our International Advisory Council. And that supplements the good advice that we get from our very strong board. So thank you for that. Um, but you see, I've, I've been holding on to this guy because I didn't want him to leave the stage. Um, I want to show you a very quick film. It, won't, it only could take two minutes, but it actually gives you some visuals on the vision of the Middle East Institute into the future. If we could see the film now. In the heart of Washington, D.C., a short walk from the White House, the Middle East Institute is a bridge to the Arab world, the oldest think tank dedicated solely to the study of the region. MEI is an invaluable resource to decision makers. Its research provides unbiased expert analysis, and its conferences draw thousands every year to hear leading voices from the Middle East. Today, MEI is experiencing the most dynamic growth in its 70-year history. A growing policy program features world-class experts with unique impact and influence. A renovated library houses over 20,000 volumes and rare maps focused on the Middle East. The venerated Middle East Journal enjoys global reach online and a popular language program draws diplomats and businessmen. Rising public demand for these successful programs is fueling the momentum for growth. Today, a once-in-a-generation opportunity exists for expansion in its current location. Next door, a recently renovated building is for sale. Purchase of this property will create a campus around an interior garden. Comprised of four buildings, this campus will house a think tank, an academic center, a library, and a one-of-a-kind gallery for contemporary Arab art. This vision for growth will strengthen regional voices by expanding the roster of Middle East experts. Contribute to sustainable scholarship in the region by hosting visiting Arab scholars and provide an opportunity for the 20 million tourists who visit the American capital annually to enjoy contemporary Arab art housed in a permanent gallery. Work has already begun on new conference facilities, enabling MEI to host large symposia and panel discussions on site. By summer 2015, MEI will triple its conference space 
these flexible facilities will host an active schedule of roundtables, seminars, classes, and both indoor and outdoor events. Today, the Middle East Institute's impact is greater than ever. Investing in MEI's expansion will ensure the vitality and growth of a unique resource in the heart of Washington, D.C. Strengthening MEI's voice in policy circles, engaging new audiences, and showcasing the wealth of Arab culture and art. So there you have it. We're expanding, we're reconstructing, and tonight we launch the Middle East Institute Arts and Culture Program, uh, which uh, will give voice to the youth in the Middle East Institute, who too many people here in Washington, I believe, and in the West, think have no voice, but they do. If you listen, you listen to their pop music, if you listen to their poems and their songs and their rap music, they have. And if you watch and you see the paintings and the graffiti that uh, they produce, you see that they have a very political message. They are defiant and they are empowered. And what the Middle East Institute intends to do is to bring the voice of the youth of the Arab and the Middle East world to the to the political capital of the, of the United States here in Washington, D.C. by creating what you've just seen is a gallery and an arts program. Now, the reason I'm hanging on to this guy so tight on the stage is because Shafiq Gabre is, has generously don pledged to donate $100,000 to start this program. He's our... He's our foundational donor. Now you will see, uh, you will see next to your half-eaten chocolate cake, because I know nobody could really finish the whole thing, you will see a, a pledge card that uh, gives you an opportunity to express your interest in either the expansion of the Middle East Institute or the initiative uh, to, to create uh, the, the arts and culture program. Now, you can put your credit cards back in your wallet. We're not asking for your money this evening. But we do want to know uh, what you're interested in. And, uh, but you know, if you, if you really want to and you want to challenge Shafiq Gabri <laughs> to match his pledge, you're certainly welcome to do yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. Please listen to the uh, oud music as you leave tonight, drive safely, or stay and network and chat with your friends because there are so many of you here this evening. Thank you so much on behalf of Kate Seeley, Paul, Robert, the staff of the Middle East Institute, our wonderful, wonderful interns, um, and thank you so much.